Scott. Uh, my name is Scott Horton, and uh, I'm a contributing editor at Harper's Magazine and a, a lecturer at uh, Columbia University, but also in the context of Bard College, I'm a trustee of uh, Bard's affiliate in Central Asia, AUCA. And just to put in a plug, I want to say uh, thanks to uh, the students at AUCA who were, uh, who were standing by watching us uh, this evening, and we're after midnight Bishkek time. Uh, and also put in a plug for the fact that our a uh, new campus is about to be dedicated at the end of this month. We're going to have a, an event on the 31st of October with uh, uh, President Atambayev and uh, Secretary of State John Kerry uh, and George Soros. Uh, so uh, that'll be a, uh, a, a burnishing of a, an important part of the Bard community uh, coming up. And I, I think now, without further ado, we'd like to move to the last section uh, of our conference today, uh, and that is to look at the same issues uh, of uh, whistleblowers, um, national security, secrecy, and privacy from the perspective of the government. And for that purpose, we have, uh, I think, uh, really a, a perfect guest. Uh, and uh, that's uh, the gentleman to my right here, uh, Robert Litt, who's uh, been a lawyer in government service with a very long and distinguished career uh, from being a law clerk to being uh, a Department of Justice uh, uh, attorney, uh, and uh, uh, I think a brief period in private practice with, with Arnold and Porter, right? And, and, uh, and most recently has served as, uh, I'd say, the lawyer at the apex of the, uh, of the national uh, security community as a general counsel to the DNI, uh, James Clapper. So I will we'll proceed with uh, uh, first. Uh, first, Mr. Litt's going to offer some uh, some remarks of his own. Then we're going to have a conversation on uh, several of the issues that have been engaged. Then we'll open things up at the end for questions uh, from the audience. Thanks, Scott. Um, as I was uh, thinking about uh, coming here for the last. Uh, couple of hours, I, two metaphors came to mind. One is that I have a better appreciation for the book of Daniel and the Bible. Um, and, and the other is, I don't know how many of you heard recently on This American Life, um, they reran, I think, a piece they'd done a couple of years ago about the comedy group that had their big break when they appeared on the Ed Sullivan show and the same show as the Beatles. Uh, and the, the, how this did not prove to make their career. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I, I want to express my thanks to those of you who, who chose to remain uh, to hear this. Um, I'm, I must say I'm modestly disappointed at the number of people who didn't, uh, given that this is an academic environment. But what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about how the intelligence community views uh, the issue of privacy. And you have, to, you have to understand at the start that the intelligence community is made up of people just like people in this room. Um, their, their parents, their, their, their children, uh, they all care about their own privacy as well. Uh, and, and in fact, I would say that uh, by and large, they tend to run towards the libertarian uh, as a whole. Um, but I think what, and, I, and I, I have not been here for the entire two days, but certainly what, uh, what Scott has relayed to me of it and, and what I've heard this afternoon, I, I don't think anybody would disagree on the importance of privacy. Uh, and, and the, val the necessary values that it uh, preserves both for individuals and for society. But privacy has never been an absolute. Um, and the difficult question comes when you try to figure out um, how much, uh, what can you do to achieve other social goals that are also important. And I think that everybody would agree that a, a principal goal that a national government has to do is to protect its people. And it's not only to protect them in the sense of airplanes flying into the World Trade Center, but it's to, pro to protect them from hostile powers who may have adverse intent in a variety of ways. Um, I actually agree that it is a mistake to refer to this as a balance, because I think that um, that implies that uh, in order to increase security, you have to decrease privacy and the other way around. I think the challenge is how can you best protect both privacy and security uh, at the same time? But that is inevitably going to involve a, a certain amount of trade-offs. For example, uh, we allow police to enter your house with a warrant. Um, we would have more privacy if that was not allowed. But we accept that as being an appropriate 
way to uh, achieve security with a minimal intrusion on privacy. The way this has been has worked uh, in uh, in in practice, uh, and I guess I'd like to give the example of the the so-called mass surveillance program, which is uh, a program under which telephone metadata was was collected. It's not true that everybody's email is collected. This is t metadata about telephone, which is like the number calling, the number called, and so on. It's the same information that your telephone company keeps when you make a phone call. And I want you to uh, understand that before this program existed, telephone companies kept this record, and the government could go with a subpoena and get this information in a criminal case. And for a variety of reasons, um, after 9-11, an intelligence gap was identified, and it was felt that this, could, this gap could be filled if the, the data were collected by the NSA and queried. And the important thing that I want you to understand is this data sat on the, uh, at NSA, and there is unquestionably a whole lot of things that could be done with this data. None of it was ever done with this data. It was strictly limited, strictly controlled, and in fact, in terms of the actual impact on anybody's privacy, it was no different than the old regime or the regime going forward, where you serve a subpoena on the telephone company and you get those records when there's an appropriate basis. And the point I want to make from that is that I think when people talk about privacy, it is important that we look at what the actual impacts on privacy are of government activities and not the theoretical impacts. Um, let me give you another example. Um, Mr. Snowden made reference to uh, a, an incident where supposedly every, uh, every phone call in the Washington area was intercepted for a couple of days. Um, that, that actually happened, and the reason it happened was that somebody made a typographical error and inserted a country code uh, into an area code. Uh, and so instead of uh, some country code, they were collecting phone calls from people in Washington. What happened? After a couple of days, the NSA discovered it itself. They stopped it. They reported it to the court. They eliminated all the phone calls. Nobody ever saw them. So something that starts by sounding like a, like a horrible intrusion on privacy actually turns out not to be. There has not been any showing of the kind of um, abuses, of uh, attempts to oppress people, of, of seeking out political dissidents um, that should be worrisome. And, and where I want to end, I guess, is by saying that I think that the where we fell down, we meaning the intelligence community fell down, and, and a number of people made reference to this, is in not communicating in the kind of broad general sense that Mr. Snowden was talking about, the broad outlines of the programs we did. Some of them, some of them we did communicate, um, but in particular this one program was not effectively communicated. There were people within the government who thought it should have been communicated, and I think that looking backwards everybody feels that had we had an opportunity had we taken the opportunity to go out and educate the public about it on, uh, on, in a sort of more neutral fashion, that it probably would have been a lot less controversial, but that's water over the dam now. Um, the, 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 the trick that we have to, the, the problem that the intelligence community is faced with is that we are politically in a, essentially a zero tolerance environment. My boss likes to say that there are two types of events in the world. There are intelligence failures and there are policy successes. And every time something bad happens, the finger gets pointed at the intelligence community. And there is a pendulum that swings back and forth in terms of the public view of the intelligence community between uh, you mean you're doing what and why didn't you protect us? Uh, and, and that's a pendulum that's going to swing again. And, that, and so the question is, what can we do now to try to put ourselves in the best possible position so that while being respectful of privacy and protective of privacy, we are still also protecting the American people? Personally, I happen to think that technology has a huge amount to contribute here. When people talk about technology in the context of surveillance, it tends to be one of two things. It's either um, look at the awful things NSA can do with technology or look at how we can protect ourselves from the NSA with technology. 
I think there's a third part of the discussion, and that is how can technology give us, the public, some assurance that the powers that the intelligence community has and has to have are not being abused. And I think that there are some very creative technological ways that systems can be set up, for example, to not only to limit access, but to ensure that only proper queries are made and that only the appropriate people get the information. And I think that there needs to be a lot of work done in that area so that people have a better understanding of what it is that the NSA does, not at the level of who's being targeted and what systems are, are we targeting, the kind of operational thing that if revealed can and has caused damage, but at the general level of what are the types of things that we're doing to protect the people. So I guess I'll, though, with those sort of um, somewhat disconnected thoughts, I'll stop and let Scott ask some questions. Thank you, Bob. Um, I, I, I want to start just uh, connecting this back to, to Hannah Arendt again. So uh, at, at this conference, we've heard uh, about Arendt's approach to privacy through a number of different writings about the human condition, um, uh, her writings on totalitarianism, uh, her Little Rock, Arkansas um, uh, essay. But it seems to me we've now reached the stage uh, in the conference where there's another, uh, there's another set of writings that has to be uh, brought in, uh, and that is the way Arendt approached uh, whistleblowers and national security issues. And of course that comes up uh, in particular uh, when she was invited by the Association of the Bar of the City of New York uh, to address the Pentagon Papers case, uh, and she gave a, a very, very interesting uh, address, uh, which, is, which is reproduced in uh, Crises of the Republic. Um, I, I have to say, too, I think it probably left most of her audience puzzled because they would have expected her to come out swinging against Nixon in the Vietnam War, and, and although I think she didn't like Nixon and didn't like the Vietnam War, that's not really what she was interested in and what she addressed uh, in this piece. She, she wanted to go and look at, at, a, much more, at a much deeper level uh, at the question of state secrecy and the role that was played uh, by, uh, the, uh, by whistleblowers uh, and the media and the entire political process and, uh, and breaking or, or, or cushioning it somewhat. And she started out talking about uh, the, the, ver the concept, the ancient concept of state secrecy. She reminded us that the term was uh, arcana imperii, which is usually translated as state secrets, but of course it actually also means mysteries of empire. Um, and that's not uh, coincidental because when you trace this idea back, it had to do with the specific power and authority of the emperor. It was something that was beyond challenge in any way, and it was meant to make him mysterious, powerful, beyond attack. Um, and that she points out, and she also described the origins of that, how it came up under, uh, under Roman law. And that's a system that made perfect sense when you're an empire but didn't necessarily make a lot of sense with a democracy. And with democracies, you of course have this inherent tension between the idea of secrecy um, and the idea of uh, popular decision, popular deliberation. And very important for her on this score is uh, the Pericles uh, oration, uh, in which he specifically derides secrecy. Uh, secrecy is uh, something that tyrannical governments think of, Pericles says. Not us. We Athenians pride ourselves on being open. We let visitors enter our city and inspect everything. We're not afraid that they will uncover our military, uh, our military tools and techniques. We rely on our bravery. Didn't, went, didn't end well for the Athenians. Did uh, to the contrary, it did. Uh, but that's something we, we can argue about. Uh, but in any event, uh, this was, in his view, a strong point. So uh, secrecy is associated directly with cowardice. Now, of course, what she comes back to in the end is a sense, a very strong sense that, you know, the American system somehow works. And it doesn't work because of the secrecy regime. And there, you know, she embraced 
the view that the German sociologists had that, you know, national security, bureaucracies use secrecy to build their own power and authority and budgets, so you've got to be very skeptical of it. You shouldn't readily accept this secrecy, but there is a legitimate role for secrecy to some extent. And how do you balance or offset it? Well, it's not going to be balanced or offset through regulations or laws or anything of that sort. It's going to be through this process of public dialogue. And there she looked at the Pentagon Papers, the, uh, the fact that information came out, that it was spread through the newspapers with critical analysis, that this spurred popular debate. And her view was the political system writes itself in the end. And the people have an opportunity to have input in the key formation of policy. So the people don't have a right to know every single tactical deliberation and consideration. The government has a good reason to keep a lot of this secret, but the people have a right to be involved in the formation of policy and to have enough information to participate. So in the end, she came out with a pretty positive view of that, that but her focus and her major concern was on that policy formation process. The people have enough information, they're able to have input, and the policies are decided through a democratic process of some sort. So that's going to bring me back to uh, the, the point that uh, our prior speaker raised, uh, and that is the, um, this report that appeared in the, in the Washington Post, uh, which referred to uh, an email uh, in which you noted that the legislative environment is very hostile today, it could turn in the event of a terrorist attack or criminal event where strong encryption can be shown to have hindered law enforcement. So you're saying essentially, as I interpret this, let's keep this in our breast pocket and bring it out at the right point when, it, when the environment's more favorable. And perhaps not when there's a calm, dispassionate and detached review, but one that can be pushed through the system very, very quickly. So is that doing justice to democratic process? Or have we misunderstood your email? So um, I want to start by saying that I make a practice never to comment on leaked documents. Uh, one of the students, who may or may not still be here, asked, uh, asked a question that I thought uh, deserved a better answer than it got, and that is about the importance of, of privacy for government deliberations. I happen to feel, I happen to feel very strongly about that. That, um, you, that government officers and employees need to be able to consult freely and talk among themselves to talk honestly and candidly in order to get the best deliberations possible and the best decisions. I completely agree that when final decisions are made, when policy is made, uh, and, and things like that, that needs to go out to the public. But I think it is very corrosive of the democratic process to have internal deliberations leaked by people with agendas uh, and, and in a frequently a misleading fashion for the purpose of influencing those deliberations through the process. So having said that, and, and as, as I said, I will say that, that uh, there is an alternative reason, reading that, that, that one could give to, the, to an email that said something like that, and that is with reference to the pendulum I mentioned a, a while ago, which is to say not that one should lie in wait uh, to seize upon a, uh, a, um, uh, a, a populace that has lost its mind, but rather that the political dynamic within the country, and of course we do have a representative government, that the political dynamic in the, country, in the country may change at some point in the future. But you would accept that, but if you have the legislative proposal in hand right now, why not put it forward and make the public argument for it? There's an assumption in your question that may or may not be accurate. And I put it as a hypothetical. Right. Um, uh, if, if they, if, I mean, there are lots of legislative proposals that float around the United States government. Many of them are colossally stupid um, and, and do not see the light of day because other people tell the drafters that these are colossally stupid. W there is a process within the government by which the government makes decisions on whether or not to seek legislation. And if the executive branch determines it doesn't want to seek legislation, um, the other people can put forward legislation, but the, le but the executive branch shouldn't be compelled to put forward legislation that it has no interest in supporting.
But I, I guess the spin that the prior speaker put on all this was that this is sort of a power grab by the national security elites, that they're very, very eager to, uh, to, grab, to get legislation that gives them broad discretion, discretion that's unreviewable, greater powers uh, all the time, uh, and increase their power and influence and make it unchecked in the democratic process. Is that fair or unfair? I think it's unfair. I think, I think it's also the case that I'd never, I've never seen the prior speaker in any policy discussions uh, at the uh, level of the government. So I don't, I don't really think he knows what is motivating the people um, in these discussions. The European Court of... Well, let me say one, one, other, one other comment he made was this. Truth and courage should matter in politics. It's impossible to disagree with that statement. <laughs> <laughs> and a, a, as he says this, courage is sort of the opposite of, of national security fear-mongering. Standing up against it, and that also matches what Pericles said. I, I, I actually think that, that that's kind of like uh, apples and elephants. Um, one can be one can be courageous in defense of national security issues. One can be courageous, Chuck in, opposi courage. in, courageous in opposition to national security issues. Um, I think it all depends upon the circumstances and the particular environment. I don't I don't think I don't think they're opposites at all. All right. Well, let, let's look. Let's start looking abroad a little bit. The, the European Court of Justice has recently handed down a, a landmark decision uh, that says that the European-U.S. safe harbor agreement uh, is invalid because uh, it allowed internet companies based in the U.S. to uh, store European users' data on servers uh, in the United States, and th this violated the privacy rights of European citizens uh, because U.S. companies uh, were required to comply with the NSA's large-scale efforts to collect data in ways that violated the EU privacy rules. Now, it's interesting that when that decision came out, a number of the major European newspapers like Süddeutsche Zeitung in, in Germany reviewed it and said, this is the highest court in Europe concluding that Edward Snowden is right and the NSA is wrong. So it was presented immediately as a strong validation of his position. It also seems to be another case in which um, maybe the strongest single sector of U.S. business uh, is facing a dilemma that's been created by uh, the U.S. intelligence community. So uh, is that a fair analysis? And what's the fix? So um, it, it's interesting. Um, this, of course, was a, a decision in a case to which the United States was not a party. Um, and it was decided uh, on factual findings that were based on press articles that were, in fact, inaccurate. Um, and in particular, um, the, the court assumed that this, uh, the uh, one particular surveillance program that people refer to as PRISM was mass indiscriminate surveillance, uh, which it is not. Um, it's targeted surveillance. It, it's a large program, but it still requires people to be targeted based on the fact that they are of, of foreign intelligence value. Um, I wrote an op-ed uh, in the Financial Times about that uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. But the opinion, because... Is it not indiscriminate as to Europeans? No, it's not indiscriminate as to Europeans. So it's it only Europeans who are of intelligence interest. Well, it's not only Europeans, but it's only... It is, it is non-Americans who are located outside of the United States who are of foreign intelligence interest. Those are the only people who can be targeted under this. Um, but I think, but, but in terms of your broader point, I, I want to circle back again to um, some, of the, uh, s some of the harm that the manner in which this information has come out has caused. And I think even, even Mr. Snowden himself has said that some of the stuff that is published is not stuff that he would have published. Um, the, the nature of this program, PRISM, was, was perfectly clear in statute. This was a statute that was openly debated by Congress, and it was perfectly clear what, the, what Congress authorized and how this program was carried out. What was new in what Snowden revealed was the identity of U.S. companies from whom this information is, uh, is obtained. Um, and it's all, all pursuant to lawful process. 
That's what caused the damage to the U.S. companies, was revealing the identities of the companies, not the existence of the program. That's the sort of thing that, in my view, is, is, is what ought to be protected, because we, the companies are maybe losing business as a result of that, but there are two other consequences that are significant. One is that I think we are going to end up seeing a balkanization of the Internet as individual countries move to set up their own Internet systems, and the, the net effect is you're going to have ro relatively robust privacy protections in the liberal democracies and very little in places like Russia and China and around the world. And I think that's going to be a very negative consequence of the last couple so of years. So just, just so I understand make, you correctly. Let me make my other okay. point. Then. Yeah. And the other point is that we have absolutely been losing our ability to collect communications of terrorists and other enemies. There, there is simply no doubt about that. There are posts that go up on jihadi forums that say, don't use this platform because they work with the NSA. See this document that's, that's been published. So, you know, that's, those are, are genuine consequences from what's happened. So you're, you're saying that the harm comes from the fact that it was disclosed that Facebook was cooperating not from the fact that Facebook is cooperating. Correct. And this, this, is, this goes... I don't think the European court would agree with that. Well, I, I, I I'm sure they wouldn't, in fact. I, I, I understand that, but, 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 but let, me, let me make my point very clear here. Yeah. Um, I, th I think that the line on transparency uh, for the intelligence community... I mean, after all, if you're going to have intelligence work, a certain amount of it has got to be in secret, or it doesn't work. Um, my view, and, and the one that I've been advocating for both inside and outside the government, is that we have to be relatively transparent about the authorities we operate under, the procedures we use, the oversight that, that exists over what is really a very highly regulated enterprise. What we have to protect are the specific methods, the specific targets, the specific sources, the things that could enable an adversary to defeat the surveillance that's lawfully authorized. And in my own view, the identity of the companies who are lawfully subject to process in the United States falls within that category. Should the Europeans have a higher level of privacy protection in this regard than the Americans? Well, I'm not sure that they do. Um, well, isn't that but, the consequence of this decision? Well, I think that they need to look at some of their own laws. But, set, but setting that aside, I think there are very good reasons why American intelligence agencies um, afford greater protections to Americans than to non-Americans. But that's, that's the key thing, though, is that when, uh, when the case is made for protection of citizens, this case is made over and over again that we protect specific rights of American citizens. And, of course, our European allies hear that and say, yes, not us. In other words, we're fair game. But, 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 but if you think about what everybody is concerned about with intelligence agencies... The, the concern historically in the United States and elsewhere has been the abuse of intelligence agencies against their own citizens. It has been spying on um, uh, Americans. Th there was a reference made earlier to COINTELPRO. It's the Stasi. It's the KGB. There are good reasons why American law restricts the ability of American intelligence agencies to spy on Americans more than it restricts the ability of American intelligence agencies to collect foreign intelligence from foreign individuals. So, so let's focus on that because I think, you know, the, the real serious point of rupture right now seems to be between the United States and Germany. In fact, I'd say Germany for the last... Uh, for the last year at least... This is, is the same Germany that was just revealed to have been spying on the United States, right? The same Germany that was just revealed to be spying on yeah, the United there, States? There was, a, there was an article in the German papers this week that the German spy agency had been targeting Americans for, uh, for espionage. For, for I, I have no, I, I, no doubt whatsoever that intelligence agencies target people all over the world. My but point. the difference with Germany is that the U.S. intelligence community maintains massive facilities on German soil to do these. And the Germans do not have comparable operations on American soil monitoring U.S. citizens. So, so you know, for the last year, Germany uh, reads about the NSA scandal. That's the way it's described almost on a daily basis. Uh, there were very important hearings in the Bundestag yesterday uh, about this, but there are almost every week. Uh, and uh, the, the point, uh, the, I guess the focus here is 
that there has been surveillance conducted on German soil of German citizens and clear violation of German law. Um, and Germans, uh, Germany's response has been to press for what they call a no-spy agreement, um, but the U.S. has, has declined uh, to go there. Um, and these developments have collectively, they've led to a pretty sharp collapse in confidence in Germany towards the U.S. intelligence community. I'd say it's pretty, it's clear that German attitudes towards the United States are warm and friendly and positive, but not towards your clientele. Um, uh, it's chilled the willingness uh, of Germany to cooperate uh, with the NSA and, and the CIA. Germany is, after all, it's the largest and wealthiest uh, of our European allies. Um, uh, how it doesn't, and I guess the the criticism that one hears articulated there over and over again is that for this administration in Washington. It's clear that the range of discretion of the spy agencies is far more important than the Atlantic Alliance that we worked for three generations to build. How do you persuade them they're wrong about that? And, and how, do you, how do you work your way out of this crisis of confidence? So the, the first point to make is that um, many of the stories and allegations that have come out have not been accurate. Uh, the Germans have a parliamentary inquiry right now to look into, in fact, whether there was any violation of German law or not. Um, and, and at the end of that inquiry, I think uh, certainly not before the end of that inquiry is the appropriate time to, for the Germans to make those judgments. But, but you accept that data trawling is a violation of German law if conducted in Germany. So uh, I don't know what you mean by data trawling. Collection of metadata in the bulk and, basis. And, and, I'm not, and I'm not going to comment on anything that was or was not done or the extent to which it was done with the cooperation. But the, there the is German a German services. Supreme Court decision saying that that is illegal. You're aware of that. Uh, I'm not aware of, of a particular German Supreme Court decision, no. Accept um, it on stipulation. Okay. I, I will accept it on stipulation. But, but what the U.S. was doing... Is, is, and whether that was in conformity with German law is what remains to be seen. The other, the, I would make two other points, however. The first is, um, I disagree with your proposition that says that the German intelligence services are less willing to cooperate with the U.S. intelligence services as a result of this. In fact, we have an extraordinarily uh, productive relationship with them as we do with many European services. We provide them through our surveillance capabilities information that they use to protect themselves, that they use to, to, to arrest terrorists in Germany and so on, and they know that and, and they give us information as well. This has not been affected. The third point I want to make is that in fact in response to this the President has made very clear that we are going to take into account the, uh, the, uh, the privacy rights of people around the world. We are going to take into account the political consequences of our surveillance, um, that we are in fact going to try to ensure that we do not harm relations with other countries by conducting espionage. Having said that, if you're going to have an intelligence agency, as you said, they're going to conduct espionage. So Angela Merkel's private uh, uh, cell phone and that of 132 other senior German officials, we can assume that's over or that's going to continue? As I said, I'm not commenting on any specific... Well, you, I think you can sector. comment that, that Miracles is over because Obama called her and told her that well, that was stopped. It, 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 I'll let, I'll let <laughs> the President comment on his discussions with Angela Merkel. Thank you very much. Um, what about the Espionage Act? I mean, I mean that, that, that issue came up quite a bit uh, recently, came up in the Democratic debates, came up just in the last couple of days uh, and remarks that Eric Holder made in which he said uh, uh, you people are just freaking out over the name Espionage Act, uh, you shouldn't get so worked up about it. Uh, but in fact I think you know it, it is a major point of focus here uh, and it is because I, I think as was pointed out here earlier um, it's, it seems to be a, a rather harsh and inflexible statute. Uh, it creates uh, per se liability. So, you know, a, uh, a government employee 
uh, uh, releases uh, this classified information, all he needs to do is admit that. In fact, uh, you know, I think one of our earlier speakers talked about uh, the Daniel Ellsberg case and, and uh, the script that was anticipated on his testimony. I mean, the instant questions raised about uh, his motive, um, that would be stopped. I mean, there would be no inquiry into that. So uh, the question of uh, intention of the person who was leaking, the question of harm to the United States, uh, the question of public benefit not addressed. Shouldn't there be a public interest defense? So let me, I, I have two comments to say about that. The, three comments. The first is Eric uh, is absolutely right. Um, the fact that this happens to be the Espionage Act is an artifact of the way the U.S. Code was constructed. There are about ten different sections in it, which range from misdemeanors up to statutes that uh, uh, if you, uh, if you, if you uh, betray uh, the country in ways that cause death, you can, it can be a capital crime. They're all lumped together under this one thing that's caused death. You don't think it has to do with congressional intent that it apply only to espionage? No, yeah, absolutely not. Absolutely not? Yeah, Notwithstanding it, the fact that there were hardly any prosecutions of whistleblowers brought uh, under that statute before Ellsberg. Well, um, the, actually there, there were some um, the, the, that I am aware of, but it, it, it clearly, if you read that statute, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a section of that statute that, apply, that, that, that makes it a crime, and I know because I represented somebody who was charged with this, to store classified material at your home improperly. By no stretch of the imagination is that an, an intent to reach espionage. So it, it, it is a statute that governs the handling of classified material in all ways. It is a piece of crap statute. It was, it was written in 1919 originally. It's been accreted on since then. It deserves to be thrown out and started all over again. So feel free to applaud. Yeah. I, I might not necessarily have the same rewrite of it that you would, but, it, but I think it... <laughs> But I think it's worth having a discussion about what the statute ought to look like. There are, there are parts of it that are wildly overcharged. There are parts of it that are wildly undercharged. But I do want to speak specifically to your question about intent and motive, because this has nothing to do with the Espionage Act. This is a basic principle of criminal law, which is that a good motive cannot excuse a bad act. This is the same defense that the people who murdered abortion providers use. They say, we are acting in the service of a higher good. And it is routine throughout our criminal justice system that you cannot defend yourself of the crime by your good motive. You can argue to the judge at sentencing in mitigation that you had a good motive. And that's the way our legal system takes that into account. But if you open the door to saying in one particular case, because you like what this particular person has done, that he should be allowed to argue he did it for a good purpose, you are going to go down a very slippery slope very rapidly. But uh, that wouldn't be the case if you created by statute an affirmative defense. And what would the affirmative defense be? Well, the affirmative defense would be a public interest defense. And who gets to determine what's in the public interest? The finder of fact. So, so if you have a, uh, if, if you have someone who, I, I mean, the, 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 p the problem you have is that you're going to, you've got 50 jurisdictions around the country with very different jury pools who are going to have very different views of what's in the public interest. Um, you're going to have people uh, arguing for things that you may think are in the public interest that they may not think are and in the public And you would be interest. trying to bring every case in the Eastern District of Virginia. Uh, no, probably not. Um, <laughs> But, um, it's changed but, but over I, the last few years. I, I, I think that that is not a feasible way to have a rule of law, to, to allow for individuals to make their own determinations about what is, or what is or is not in the public interest. That's what Congress is there to decide on a policy level for the nation. As I said, I think the statute ought to be rewritten. But I don't think you should, you, you should have a statute that says people can, people can disclose classified information if they think it's in the public interest to do so. I just, I just do not I, think... I don't think anybody's proposing that statute. Well, um, right. it, it gets pretty close to that. Right. Uh, who do you think actually learned the most from the, from the Snowden documents? you think it was our enemies, it was terrorists, uh, and not the American people? I, I can't quantify, but, but all of those people learned from those documents. Because everybody learned what was published. But, you know, was it real news to terrorists? Yes. You think so? Absolutely. And, 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 and not only terrorists. I mean, it was, it was news to nation states as well. 
um, who, who we are uh, in greater or lesser degrees of adversarialness. Sophisticated nation states? Ab absolutely. With the Russian Federation, the Chinese? Absolutely. Absolutely they have learned things from this. I disagree with you on that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there, there was a degree of exposure of specific capabilities that had not, that, that, that had not been exposed before, Scott. Mm -hmm. Well, but it, what you will agree, it was eye-opening for the American public, oh, I, it, and I, it had I, a strong I'm, impact I'm, on public I'm, debate. I'm not quantifying. Um, as, as I said, I'm, I'm not going to get into who who uh, learned more from it. I, I, absolutely, the American people learned, and 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 there is no question that, as I said, some of what came out should have been made public before. I, I agree on that. But so, far more was revealed than, in my judgment, should have been. So, I mean, let's look at the, uh, at the disclosures that came yesterday. And I'm not going to ask you to comment on them because I know you, Good. you shouldn't. But, you know, of course, we had a, a large portfolio of uh, documents, Department of Defense documents, uh, concerning uh, drone warfare and a particular targeted uh, killing program. Uh, and. Uh, the argument for that disclosure is, whatever the details of this program, this marked a major shift in policy of the United States government. Not a question of individual strikes of individual people on times, but the way we conduct ourselves in wartime and the way we fight wars. And it created a new kind of warfare, which is particularly covert so you have one drone strike, fine. You have 400 drone strikes over 10 years. Is that something that should be avoiding the process of public deliberation and discussion the way uh, the American political process has provided for a century? So I guess I have two comments. The first is that um, nothing DOD does is covert. Um, DOD, uh, by, by the laws of war, is required to acknowledge everything they do. And the second thing is that I have not noticed an absence of discussion about drones in this country in the last five but years. But you've noticed an absence of U.S. government official participation in this discussion. No. And I what, when you say I'm it's not, not covert... Not I've actually not noticed that. But you, uh, I have. Uh, uh, but I, I think when you, you say nothing, nothing the Department of Defense does is covert, JSOC, you think, is not engaged they, in they covert are, they, activities? They, they are not engaged in covert activities. Absolutely not. There is a difference between... Yeah. No, um, uh, it, it's true. Um, the, I mean, what you say about the Department of Defense generally is absolutely true. Right. I agree. That's a very important when, thing, when, when, which is, which is the, I think, a very yeah. significant point to keep in mind about this drone program specifically. Right. So, you know, to the extent another government agency is doing it as a covert operation, it's not going through these processes that the Department of Defense has developed over generations since its founding to ensure that there's a public vetting and a public discussion of basic level policy, right? So CIA activity, CIA warfare, as long as it can be called covert activity, is not subject to that process. It's subject to a different process. Um, and, and as I said, to the extent that your point is that there should be a public discussion about whether or not drones should be used in the conduct of this conflict, that public discussion has happened. It's happened in Congress. It's happened with the executive branch. There have been numerous speeches given by executive branch officials on this. This is not an issue. There, there are specifics about drone activity that have been withheld. But the, the policy discussion about drones has been vigorous and lively and, and involving the government as well as the private sector. I, 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 just, I have a fundamental problem with that contention. So, uh, and in fact, I, I think we've got, you know, we have Ben with us and we have Ken Anderson who've, you know, recently done a book basically describing that debate and that policy elaboration. And they've described it as a policy platform that's been put forward by the administration. But when I go through and I look at it, I think, now wait a minute, these are long after the fact rationalizations and explanations for what was done. That's really, and that's not what the Department of Defense means when it talks about policy. They're talking about establishing procedures in advance, taking comment on that, taking that into account, putting it through congressional process. So it's really, it's a, an after the fact attempt to provide cover 
rather than a really meaningful discussion. Well, and I, I don't know what you mean by after the fact. There's no question the, the, the drone program started in the prior administration. I had no knowledge of what happened then. That's, that's before my time. I can tell you that since, the, since President Obama has taken office, there has been a significant effort to try to, to regularize, to try to uh, be as transparent as possible about the, the, the legal framework within, the, within which the drone program operates, um, not only ex post, but ex ante. Um, and uh, and to, to, so that people know the framework within the, when, excuse me, the framework within which this program is being carried out. There, there is not a specific public discussion in advance of targeting individuals. Um, there is, however, a, a, a generic discussion and a much more detailed discussion with the Congress. Okay, I, I think it's probably uh, about time for us to open up uh, for the floor and uh, take questions. You have to forgive my myopia, but I'm going to pick people who are close up who I can see. So go ahead. You have to wait for the uh, microphone to come on so you can be heard. Thank you. Um, first, I'm sorry. I'm not uh, an American citizen. But uh, we are all human beings, so I think I can make my question. So I know that some of values remembered here as truth and humanity maybe are out of fashion. <laughs> so somebody can consider that thinking about these values is naive. But, sir, if what Mr. Snowden says is not important because, in fact, we are only talking about technical mistakes, why is Mr. Snowden in Russia you'll have to ask and not him. here? You'll have to ask him that. No, I I, I, I'm, I'm, he, I'm, he shouldn't be in Russia. He should be back in this country. But you, you did revoke his passport. I didn't. <laughs> The U.S. government. I, I, I promise you, if he wanted to come to this country, he could get to this country. Okay. And that, that would be up to the advice of his counsel, too. Go ahead. Right. Thank you. Uh, wow, that's a lot. Are you, are, like all of your documents surveyed by the NSA, is your data collected by the NSA, and are you ever a suspect in terrorist um, investigations, which, as according to the NSA, is the point of surveillance. So let me just, uh, let me start by correcting that last point, uh, because terrorism is not the only point of surveillance. Uh, there are other important foreign intelligence mm -hmm. reasons why surveillance occurs. NSA basically has no authority to conduct targeted surveillance of any American anywhere. Um, it, 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 surveillance, if you are targeting Americans, that's going to be done generally by the FBI. Uh, and that's going to be done pursuant to warrant processes uh, by statute. In terms of, is my information being collected? I don't know. Um, you know, if I, if I am talking with someone who happens to be a valid target of foreign intelligence surveillance, if, I, if I'm talking to somebody who turns out to be a Russian diplomat and the NSA is surveilling that person, yes, my communication might be intercepted under those circumstances. Can, can I just ask, you know, one of the questions that was raised earlier had to do with the Mayor Brown and Platt case where they were engaged in negotiations on behalf of the government of uh, Indonesia on tariffs and rates yeah. and that was disclosed to have been uh, intercepted. So my, what my would be the possible rationale for that? So, S Scott, I may be wrong, but my recollection is that that was not interception by NSA. That was interception by a partner service. By a partner service? Yeah. Um, it, another uh, U.S. Another, government intelligence. No, 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 no. Another country. Another country. Yeah, I, I, I may be wrong, but that's. But my recollection is that that was not a United States intelligence collection activity. Okay, very good. So let's here in the front. Third row. Um, I've always thought that the most critical means of controlling executive action or any government action is the balance of powers and checks and balances we have in our government. Um, could you discuss the relationship between the defense of the um, national intelligence community and Congress, whether it's working, it's dysfunctional, the disputes with Senator Boxer seem to be extraordinarily troubling? Feinstein. 
Feinstein. Feinstein, excuse me. The other California, California senator. Yeah, Feinstein. <laughs> um, uh, senator uh, Wyden's dispute with General Clapper is, is, is troubling. Is, is there things that could be done to improve that, uh, that oversight, uh, make it more uh, useful, and uh, give the American people a better uh, sense of confidence that there's actually someone who's looking at the activities of the intelligence community? So that's a really good question. Um, and um, because I think that, that we have, there's a statutory obligation on the intelligence community that we have to keep the intelligence committees of the Congress informed of all intelligence activities. After, after the um, uh, Church and Pike committees, of which we have a representative here in the front row, uh, did their investigations in the 70s, uh, and there was felt to be a need for more congressional oversight. The solution to achieving oversight and still protecting secrets was to set up congressional intelligence committees, one in the Senate and one in the House, we, who, who get almost all of the information about everything we do. And it, it's important to note that the programs that have been leaked, every single one of them was completely disclosed to the intelligence committees. They knew all about them. Th this was the trade-off that was made, was basically we'll, we'll talk with the intelligence committees fully, but they will not necessarily share everything with the rest of the Congress. They will be the proxies for the American people. It may be that that model has now broken down and that there will have to be um, more oversight through the committee of the whole. This is something that the Congress is basically going to have to work out what they're comfortable with. Um, but uh, I, I think that's something that's going to play out over the next few years. Um, I will say that, that as the back and forth with Chairman Feinstein shows, the, the oversight that we get is pretty vigorous and rigorous. The, the last administration was a little bit less cooperative than this administration was, and that's what really has gotten uh, Senator Feinstein particularly fried. Um, hopefully we'll be able to work through that, and I, but I do think it's worth looking at the way in which oversight is conducted and seeing if there's a way that we can get more people into the oversight process while still protecting information that needs to be protected because the intelligence committees get a lot of incredibly sensitive information, identification of human sources and so on and so forth, and that has to be protected. All right, here. So I, I want to make it clear that I do believe that some things have to happen in secrecy, and I and I'm prepared to, to acknowledge that. As the as the chief exec, as, as the chief executive officer of a not-for-profit corporation, I was required to develop a whistleblower policy that protected whistleblowers, that it allowed whistleblowers to to look at my organization and reveal information within a structure that that uh, that might lead to that might re reflect bad acts on our part. And part of that policy uh, that's required by the state of New York requires me to protect the, those individuals and not have, and not have uh, for lack of a better word, blowback or a or, or reaction to their behavior. Um, I think rather than using the espionage policy uh, uh, laws, we should have a very good and excellent framework for whistleblowers to work within the structure of government to bring these things to the attention of government and none of this would have happened. And I find it uh, disconcerting that the American government is not, prote not prepared to protect its own employees and contractors from blowing the whistle on things that are inappropriate actions of government within a safe and protected framework. So actually there, <laughs> actually there is such a framework. Uh, it exists. There are statutes and there are executive orders that, that prohibit retaliation against whistleblowers. What the, the, the question, the problem is your, your stipulation that it be within a safe and protected framework. That's what the Whistleblower Act to do. But what happens is people raise claims internally and they don't get satisfaction. And so they go public with them. They go outside of the safe and protected framework because they don't like the results that they've obtained. But there is, in fact, a very robust whistleblower protection. There's an Office of Special Counsel that's responsible for investigating allegations of retaliation against whistleblowing. There are statutory protections. Uh, it does exist. 
But you, you also have, I mean, as in the case of, of Thomas Drake, you have whistleblowers who raise issues and then become targets of investigations for things they didn't do. I also make it a practice not to comment on individual cases other than to say that I think that, that the facts in Drake are not necessarily what they have appeared to be uh, through his public relations. You think the yeah. federal judge who oversaw the case got it wrong when he said that these were more, this was more heinous conduct than perpetrated by the British at the outset of the American Revolution? Well, I... I it was a rather <laughs> strong set of words. If that's what he said, I think he got it wrong. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'd really like to hear from some students. So, do we, do we have... Scott, we've got time for two or three more questions. Maybe take them and then let them answer. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's, take, uh, let's take two or three questions. At Sir, one. I have a question right here. <laughs> if I may ask, uh, you said earlier that the United States is not, is not surveilling or has no interest in surveilling dissident political activists. The, I think two weeks ago it was revealed that Black Lives Matter prote protests in, in sort of in vigilance for... Where are you? Can you stand up? Yes, sir. I can stand up. Okay. Thank you. I want to read to you exactly, I, exactly from the article that I'm referencing so I don't get anything wrong. And just tell me, as you read it, what agencies you're talking about. This is the Department of Homeland Security, sir. Right. So this is not the intelligence community. Which no, it isn't, but about. it sets a precedence, and I would like for you to expand on that. So I... It, I haven't asked my question yet. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I thought that was a question. I apologize. No. So the specific event in question was a Black Lives Matter vigil for Rekia Boyd, that was on Facebook, and the, the request leads, uh, reads, we are monitored, monitored, monitoring two separate protests scheduled for this evening. The first will begin with a gathering at DuPont Circle, and their call for action on Facebook states, every 28, 28 hours a black person is killed in America by law enforcement officers. This statistic includes black women and girls as well. What does a vigil like that, what, what, what need for it, what, why do we need to surveil it? Okay, well, so let's, before you answer, let's get two more questions here. Yeah, actually, actually, I'd rather not. Let, rather yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know anything about what DHS was doing in that circumstance. Um, as someone who was the subject of surveillance for peaceful demonstrations when I was young, I don't think you should be surveilling peaceful demonstrations. But that's not what my clients do. What I was saying was that in the, in the programs that Snowden has leaked, there has been no indication of any of that kind of activity, and that is absolutely true. Also, could you expand on the convoluted trade-offs idea one, that... One, one question only. I think we need to give some other people... Go ahead. Here. So, as you may know, uh, intentionally deceiving Congress is a felony punishable by up to five years in prison. Should James Clapper be in jail? And if not, how do you defend the notion that all people are treated equally before the law in the United States? I, I, was, actually hoping to, I was actually hoping to avoid uh, uh, answering this because I've, I've done this uh, on a number of occasions. I have letters to the uh, New York Times and the New Yorker. Um, I was there. Um, he didn't lie. Um, he, this was a hearing, and, and, and I'm sorry because you're going to have to get the full story now. Um, this, this was a hearing... Uh, an open hearing on the, intel the full scope of the intelligence threats facing the United States. Uh, the DNI had two notebooks this thick of information that he had to study for that. Uh, he hates this hearing because he's, he's always worried about unintentionally disclosing classified information. He was not thinking about surveillance in his preparation. He was not focused on that. And if you read his answer carefully, you will see that what he was talking about was a different program, which does not, in fact, target Americans. But it, 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 when I spoke to him afterwards, and I, say, and I said to him, you know, director, there was this, this program, and he said, oh, my God, I completely forgot about it. And we spoke with Wyden staff about that. And, you know, you can laugh or... or, or well, why wasn't there a public correction immediately? Well, there couldn't have been a, there couldn't have been a public correction because the program was classified at that time. 
What I regret is that, that we did not immediately send a classified letter. But you didn't have to disclose the you program. Were, you could have just said that the statement was inaccurate. Oh, Scott, right. You're going to say, the state, you're going to say oh, in fact, we are surveilling hundreds of millions of Americans, and that's going to end it? I don't think so. With the, to the extent the program I think you should have said that, yeah. But, okay, so we have the statement for the defense for Mr. Clapper. Yeah. Let's have one more question. Let's hear. Right here. Here. Here, right here. Um, I think I'll be the first to say thank you, Mr. Litt, um, for coming here. I think it's a really important debate, and we benefit from having you here. Okay. All right. This used to be a civil space. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming, and we really benefit from having you here and expanding on this debate. I recently, with the guy over there, thanks, um, we had the privilege of interviewing Ben Weisner, who, believe it or not, had nothing bad to say about you. <laughs> and we didn't ask him, but, <laughs> you know, he, he said you're a very worthy adversary. Um, <clears throat> and Ben has described the environment as a before and after. And as a before, as a before, and, after. before and after. The legal environment. We're asking about legal strategies and obstacles. And he said that there's kind of a before and after Snowden. Now, before Snowden, um, litigants were told they had no standing either proving grievance or, or harm, courts would dismiss cases, um, either issuing, you know, classification or s state secrets and stuff like that. But after Snowden, courts now have experienced this kind of watershed threshold. You know, it's like they're taking cases, they're hearing people. These arguments have been tossed out. Um, I would hope to get your perspective on this issue of justiceability and how it's changed in Snowden and how you kind of see the field in that sense. So what, I think what's happened is, particularly with respect to the telephone metadata program, courts have found standing in that regard because of the scope of that program. Uh, in, in general, otherwise, the landscape has not really changed. People are still not finding standing. What has happened, though, is that with res the, the government has adjusted its disclosure policy and has disclosed a little more about when it's targeting. And so there have been some criminal cases in which some of these charges have come up. Uh, but but I, I don't think the courts are fundamentally rethinking the, the law of standing at this point. I, I want to I make one last point uh, of privilege, and that is to the extent there are still students left in this room, um, to urge you, to the extent you care about these issues, to consider a career in government service. Um, I've, I've been fortunate over the, over the course of my career to spend about half of my time in private practice and half of my time in government. And I can tell you that, um, except for twice a month when you get paid, the worst days in government are much more rewarding than the best days in private practice. Because you have the opportunity to influence these decisions, to, to exercise judgment on behalf of the American people, and to do what you think is right. And there is no substitute for having people in government who are sensitive to these sorts of issues. You don't want to leave it to the people who are, to the, to the Dick Cheney's of the world, to be running the government. Well, well uh, there, are, there are a lot of students here, and I, I am thrilled that you're here. Um, there's also students watching in Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Berlin, the West Bank, New York, and at three overflow rooms on campus. Um, I also want to extend a very heartfelt thanks, both to Scott Horton, but really to Robert Litt. Uh, you know, he, he knew it would be a tough conversation coming onto a campus. Uh, I. Anyone who talks to Scott Horton knows it's going to be a co tough conversation. Um, and um, uh, it, I think, was an important, important part of our discussion here. And I want to thank you very much for coming. Um, and, and, and thank you for What, you know, and, and, thank, and thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Our conference next year is going to be on how to, how to talk about difficult questions, race, <laughs> race, sex, and religion on campus. And um, one of the things that we try and do at BARD and at the Han Aaron Center is talk about difficult questions. And if anything, what we've done trying to do these two days, but over these last two panels as well, 
is raise difficult questions. Um, I'm thrilled you came here to help us do that in a civil, and I think it was a very important, and I applaud everyone in the room for having a very intelligent conversation about it. Let's go drink and eat, and we'll see you later. Thank you.